כל היום היא שיחתי, מה טוב לי תורת פיך. כל היום היא שיחתי, מה טוב לי תורת פיך. כל היום היא שיחתי, מה טוב לי תורת פיך. כל היום היא שיחתי. מה טוב לי תורת פיך, כל היום היא שיחתי. מה טוב לי תורת פיך, כל היום היא שיחתי. מה טוב לי תורת פיך, כל היום היא שיחתי. מה טוב לי תורת פיך. כל היום היא שיחתי, מה טוב לי תורת פיך, כל היום היא שיחתי, מה טוב לי תורת פיך, כל היום היא שיחתי, מה טוב לי תורת פיך כל היום היא שיחתי, מה טוב לי תורת פיך. כל היום היא שיחתי, מה טוב לי תורת פיך. כל היום היא שיחתי. some app it's there and some the live is missing hi <laughs> Bezat Hashem, Bezat Hashem, we're going to have a shiur, whether the Yetzirah wants it or not, we're going to do it, we're going to do it, we're going to do it. Ma tov li tarat picha, kol ayom isichati, ma tov li tarat picha. כל היום היא שיחתי, מה טוב לי תורת פיך. כל היום היא שיחתי, מה טוב לי תורת פיך. כל היום היא שיחתי, 
בעזרת השם, בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוך השם, השתבח שמעון אהד ויהיה בנה פטוני, תורה ותורה 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 obstacles, many different excuses and reasons of why we should not have it, but the Torah is so beautiful, we have to have a shiur, Baruch Hashem. Tonight's shiur is going to be for the Refuah Shlema, for the Rabbanit Levana Bat Sara, Rabbi Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sara Bat Anat, Avimori David Ben Esriya, Imimorati Doris Bat Jora, and all of Am Yisrael that's been hurt in any way, shape, or form, whether physically or emotionally, or mentally, in any other way, spiritually, from these terrorists that are unfortunately among us. They're unfortunately among us in this uh, disgusting situation that we are all dealing with right now, which a world that surrounds us is telling us that it's okay to kill us. And they're even having the audacity to have protests about it. And they're being given airtime. So of course we have to meet the root of the terrorist. The root of the terrorist starts with this week's parasha, parasha Toldot. We meet Esav. Esav is the grandfather of Amalek. And as the Abarbanel says to us, as the Abarbanel says to us that Amalek is not only an Esav anymore, Amalek infiltrated into Ishmael as well. Infiltrated into Ishmael as well. Infiltrated into the Philistines which some Chachamim say also have a connection to the uh, spiritually, and some even say otherwise, that uh, have a connection to the Palestinians, Palestinians, Imach Shimon Vezichram, the hate Am Yisrael. There are some that are decent human beings, and them are not the, they are not the ones we're referring to. But unfortunately, the vast majority of the Muslim world hates us, and hates us with a passion, and that's because... That's what they've been taught their whole lives in their heretical Quran. But of course, we're not here to talk about the Quran. We're not here to talk about the Philistines. We're not here to talk about any of them. We're here to talk about tzaddikim. Why tzaddikim? Because someone that understands what a tzaddik is and actually had the opportunity to cleave to a tzaddik knows that that tzaddik can make your life, beautiful life, full of clarity, even if you have many difficulties. But a person that doesn't know what a tzaddik is and only knows what a tzaddik sounds like, perhaps even looks like from a distance, will have no concept of what I'm talking about. Now in this week's parasha, we see the birth of Esav. And as the Me'am Loez says, Esav was really supposed to be a tzaddik. He was supposed to be a tzaddik. He was supposed to be one of our forefathers. He had the opportunity to be a father to six of the tribes. And initially, him and his brother Yaakov grew up in the same place, went to the same yeshiva of Shem and Evel, and were going on the same path until Esav decided that uh, he wants no more of this. And uh, of course, after he murdered, raped, committed idolatry, made every possible sin under the sun, and lost the blessing, that Yaakov, that uh, Yitzchak, his father, was uh, initially intending to give to him, but he lost it to uh, Yaakov by, of course, the divine hand of Akadosh Baruch Hu. Esav had an opportunity to turn things around and realize, okay, obviously things are not working for me. Maybe I should go with this tzaddik. Maybe I should go with this Yaakov. Perhaps his winning streak indicates that his is the right path. His is the path that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants. But of course, Esav did not do this. And there are some people around us today and some people among us today and there are some people that were even friends of ours and some people that were students of ours that had similar choices where they felt like they were doing their share of the work and they didn't want to uh, do more. In fact, when uh, push came to shove, they decided that uh, they could do better on their own. Now, what does that actually mean? And we're going to, Be'ezot Hashem, learn about that. And if we have the opportunity in the Siyat Dishmaya, we'll also explain to you why this beautiful tune that uh, I was singing to you earlier today, the tune that Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hu gave me last night at our event that we had, 
here in Eretz Yisrael, in, the, uh, in Yerushalayim, we had another event, private event last night, that uh, has a lot to do with everything that we're talking about today, which is honoring the tzaddikim. Last night, we uh, did, uh, did another uh, event, a much smaller event than we had a couple of weeks ago. Private, mostly family uh, event. Uh, and uh, in order to honor the tzaddikim that uh, needed to be honored, one of them, of course, was Rabenu Moreno. Atenet Roshenu, Arab Ephraim Kachlon, for celebrating a, uh, the extraordinary monumental siyumim that he made, whether it's the Talmud Bavli, Talmud Yerushalmi, the Tosefta, uh, uh, the Shuchan Aruch, the Midrash, the Tanakh, uh, and uh, several other things, all in a single year, Baruch Hashem. Or it's the uh, celebration of him getting the crown of Torah by some of Gdolei Ador, uh, like Rav Yaakov Zamir, Rav Gidon Ben Moshe, and other major Chachamim that you saw in the video that uh, send our, their support, uh, Baruch Hashem. But that wasn't uh, the only reason, because we had other tzaddikim that we were celebrating with. One of them was a, uh, a young boy that uh, was, uh, I think he's maybe uh, 11 or 12 years old. And this little tzaddik, apparently HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted him to have special honor. We had also a couple of other Talmudim of ours that completed the Talmud Bavli in a single year. Uh, actually, one of them was uh, Rabbi Ephraim's brother, Rabbi Gavriel, uh, much younger than him. He's in his early 20s, uh, relatively newly married over the last couple of years. Bezot Hashem, Hashem will give them a zera uh, she'ikaymah, uh, and they'll have many children that tzaddikim like him and his dear wife. And he told us last night that for uh, the last 10 years he's been studying the Shas, the Talmud Bavli, but he never completed it. But then last year when we uh, started this uh, extraordinary uh, mission to get people to complete the entire Talmud Bavli in a single year by having a study regiment of completing at least seven dapim per day, uh, and we uh, convinced him to do it also, take it upon himself, pretty much start from scratch and do it all in one year, what he wasn't able to do in 10 years. And uh, Akadosh Baruch Hu was with him. Once he saw that Gavriel was yearning for more Torah, Akadosh Baruch Hu gave it to him and he said himself, what I didn't achieve in 10 years and didn't even think was possible to do in a single year, I did, Baruch Hashem. And, uh, and he's already on his path on his uh, road to completing the Shas the second time, Baruch Hashem, completing what he did the first 10 years. But the one of the things that was uh, very, very uh, inspiring was uh, seeing this young boy, anyone that watched our uh, 3000 Siu Mim uh, event and uh, enjoyed every minute of it, whether it was the beautiful music of Torah or it was the beautiful Divrei Torah of different Chachamim that spoke, uh, or it was the uh, uh, different siyumim where you see, Baruch Hashem, dozens and dozens of uh, young kids as well as Avrichim, adults of all ages, taking upon themselves a uh, monumental amount of Torah and completing it in a single year where the uh, adults over 13 years old, I think the oldest among them was probably in his 60s, uh, completed uh, the entire Talmud Bavli in a single year. Uh, and uh, we had several dozen of them. And then, of course, we had the young uh, boys that took upon themselves uh, to complete the entire Shas Mishnayot in a single year. And we had, uh, I believe it was uh, over 30, maybe three dozen of them uh, that uh, actually achieved this. And uh, to see young kids, 11, 10, 12 years old, uh, celebrate the Torah that they've toiled over day and night over the last year uh, was something uh, unprecedented. It was a, a special joy, a special taste of what Gan Eden looks like. And uh, each of us that uh, looks at it prays that our children will do the same. But there was a special story, even within the special stories. There was a young boy that uh, 
had apparently a Kadosh who wanted him to have a separate celebration. Why did this boy get a separate se celebration? That's because this young boy came from a very difficult past life and short life has been very difficult, a broken home. His parents abandoned him. His uh, grandparents took him on and uh, he doesn't have any Torah background, any religiosity whatsoever. His parents were completely secular and of course spiritually sick. And uh, once his grandparents took him on, they figured that maybe, uh, you know, they should put him into a Jewish school and they decided that they're going to put him into a yeshiva and he started learning in yeshiva and uh, fell in love with it and started taking things more seriously. But about six months ago, one of his uh, classmates told him that uh, the reason why he was studying the Mishnah outside of school was because it had nothing to do with school, but rather is something separate that some of the boys are trying to do, which is to study the entire Mishnah in a single year because of this program that uh, this organization from America called Bez Hashem is doing. And anyone that uh, completes it gets a respectable sum of money and a, a big event. But it already started six months ago. But that didn't deter him. He says, if you can do it, I can do it. Yeah, but of course, you can do it. But it takes a year. And that's only if you really dedicate it every day. But he said, I'm going to go for it anyway. I'm going to try to complete the entire Shas Mishnayot in six months, even though it's the first time I'm ever studying it, even though I don't have anywhere near the amount of background as most of the other young kids have in the uh, yeshiva. I'm going to dedicate every one of my waking hours to learning Torah. And this young kid, in six months, completed what most people don't complete in their entire life, and completed the entire Shas Mishnayot. And because he did such a big thing, we decided that uh, we're going to have him as part of this event that we had last night to, to do his official siyum, to do his official siyum privately, aside from the big celebration and everything, but to do a special siyum then. And you see this young kid, this beautiful neshama, so nervous, so serious, so dedicated, say the divrei Torah and uh, say the siyum, uh, and it uh, really melts your heart. Now, why can he do it, and you can't? That's not a question. That's not a statement. That's a question you should be asking yourself. Why can he, this twelve-year-old boy, complete the entire shas mishnayot? And you, in your 20s, in your 30s, in your 40s, why can't you? The real answer is you can. The real answer is you can. It's in your mouth, it's in your heart to do it. If you really want to do it. The same thing goes for the Shas Bavli, Shas Yerushalmi, and all of the other parts of the Torah if somebody really dedicates themselves. Now, why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu decide to give this young boy such honor? Why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu decide to give all of these tzaddikim so much honor? Why does HaKadosh Baruch Hu spend so much of the Torah talking about these tzaddikim where anyone that actually studies the, the words that are used and the statements that are made and the stories within the stories sees how much HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves tzaddikim. In the beginning of Parashat Toldot, we're reminded of Avraham Avinu. Where it says, Ve'ele Toldot Yitzchak ben Avraham, Avraham olid et Yitzchak. Avraham olid et Yitzchak, as I told you guys yesterday, the reason why the Torah says that Avraham begat Yitzchak as if Avraham gave birth to Yitzchak is because HaKadosh Baruch Hu was protecting the honor 
of Avram Avinu, from all of the naysayers that thought that really, since Avram was not able to bring a child to the world with Sarai's wife for a hundred years, certainly he wasn't able to do it now, and therefore they assumed that Yitzchak was really the son of Avimelech and Sarah. But of course, HaKadosh Baruch Hu made it so that the face of Yitzchak was identical to Avram to the point where people could not tell the difference. People would stop Yitzchak in the middle of the street thinking he's Avram. People would stop Avram in the middle of the street thinking he's Yitzchak. But the question is, now that we know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted to protect the honor of Avram, what about the honor of Sarah? Sarah obviously also got some people, some nasty women that like to have what I call Genom parties. Genom get-togethers. You know what Genom get-togethers are? A bunch of girls get together and talk about people. Oh, you know what she did? You know what he did? You know who got married? You know who got divorced? You know who just had a child? You know who just had an abortion? You know who just had a miscarriage? You know who bought a house? You know who didn't buy a house? You know, you know, you know, you know. They want to be the CNN of the world. There's a special place in Gehenom for people that like to talk about people. Why? Because it's all the Shonara. It's all the Shonara. And the Rambam says, someone that occasionally says, the Shonara has said it, could still have a share of the world to come. But certainly someone that does it on a regular basis, talks about people on a regular basis, certainly he or she does not have a share of the world to come. But people do it because they're either ignorant of the consequence or they simply don't care. Now, Sarai Menu had a bunch of these types of women in our neighborhood. They like to talk about Sarah. What did she cook today? What did she do today? Who's this? Who's that? How does she all of a sudden have a kid? She's so old, but she looks young. So people had something to say. People had something to say. So what about the honor of the tzaddikah? What about the honor of the tzaddikah Sarai Menu? Did HaKadosh Baruch protect the tzaddikah? I'll let you guys think about that for a second. And we actually have proof that HaKadosh Baruch did protect the honor of the tzaddikah. How? The Pasuk says in the Torah, V'Hashem birech et Avraham bakol. HaKadosh Baruch Hu blessed Avraham with everything, bakol. Chazal come over there and say, bakol is not just meaning that Avraham was blessed with everything, but rather bakol was the name of Avraham Avinu and Sarai Menu's daughter. They had a daughter named bakol. Now what about this daughter? What did she do? Who did she marry? How long did she live? Chazal over there bring, and they say that Bakol died at birth. This young, beautiful Neshama was carried for nine months, born, died. So what's the point? How is this protecting the honor of the Tzadikah? The commentaries of holy Jewish sages explain to us that since the nasty women that like to go to the parties of Genom and like to talk about Sarai Menu the Tzadikah, since they said, listen, are you really thinking, are you really serious to think that Sarai Menu really gave birth to Yitzchak, to this boy? No way. She probably put a pillow under our shirt. And really the birth is probably from Hagar. The birth of somebody else, it's not really from us. She's old. Even though she looks young, she's old. So in order to show everyone that it really, Yitzchak was really the son of Avraham and Sarah, HaKadosh Baruch Hu made another miracle and gave them another baby to show the whole world 
that she was the one that carried the baby. But since this neshama was a pure neshama that did not have to fix anything in this world, she didn't need to go to this world and Bakod, the daughter of Avraham and Sarah, her only mission in the world was to come to the world in order to protect the honor of her parents. That was our tikkun, and she went to Olam Abba. Here we see Rabotai Karim, how much Akadosh Baruch Hu, if you will, turns over the world, turns over the world in order to protect the tzaddik, in order to bring honor to the tzaddik. As the Gemara in Maseret Brachot says, Gdola Shimusha min limuda. It's greater the servitude that you have of a tzaddik, of a chacham, than even learning from him. If you had the merit to make major sacrifices throughout your life on a regular basis in order to serve a talmit chacham, a tzaddik, that's even greater than learning from him. Why? Because the ways of the tzaddikim, the behaviors of the tzaddikim are a Torah of itself. To such an extent the Chachamim say that someone that learned Torah all his life, learned Gemara, learned the Mishnah, learned the uh, Shukhan Aruch, learned Allah from different Rishonim and Achronim, learned Musar, learned Midrashim, learned the entire Torah, but never served the Talmud Chacham, never brought him coffee, never gave him a ride, never supported what he was doing, never listened to his instructions, never taken Musar from him, never pretty much broken his back for the sake of being around this Tzaddik. Although he learned all this Torah, he still considered an Amaritz, considered ignoramus. Yeah, but he learned the Shukhan Aruch. He learned the Zohar. He learned Gemara. He learned Midrashim. He could even give a lecture. He's an Amaritz. Why? If you don't know the value of serving a tzaddik, the value of serving Talmidei Chachamim, certainly you don't know what Torah is. Even if you read or you think you read. HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us, HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us, Avraham Olid Yitzchak. Avraham Olid Yitzchak, meaning that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted to make sure that the whole world knows how important it is, the honor of the tzaddikim, in the eyes of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now, of course, the two sons of Yitzchak have the same upbringing. Have the same upbringing, the same opportunities. But one of them chooses to go and sit in a yeshiva, that's Yaakov, and Esav decides to be a gangster. Esav decides to be a criminal. Not in front of his parents, when he's not in front of his parents. He decides to do whatever he wants. He decides to go after all of the materialism of this world, watch movies, pornography, adultery, drugs, all the filth of this world. Instead of go and learn another couple of dapim in the Gemara, he goes car racing. Instead of going to pray to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he goes and uh, gets uh, high or drunk with his friends. But on the outside, anytime he was next to his father, he looked like a tzaddik. He was already born with a beard. That's what Chazal say. Say he was red. He was born with a beard. Little baby with a beard. Full grown teeth. And despite this opportunity that he had, having a brother that's a tzaddik, having a father that's a tzaddik, having a grandfather that's a tzaddik, all in his life, on top of the Rosh Yeshiva, of Shem and Evel being there, Esav still chose otherwise. His addiction to materialism was so deep that after he heard that Nimrod had the special garment of Adam Rishon, 
that Chazal say actually brought him superpowers. No one was able to kill Nimrod. Esav fooled Nimrod to take off the garment and then murdered him. On the same day that he went to get the, uh, uh, that he sold his firstborn rights. And what did he sell them for? A pot of, a pot of beans, a stew. Now, really, if you look at things, the Torah says in multiple places, Midvar Sheker Tinchak, from a thing of lies you stay away from. We have many different alachot when it comes to onenut, when it comes to cheating, being a uh, deceitful. On the surface of things, if you don't know the background of the story and the details of it, it looks like the sale of the firstborn rights from Esav to Yaakov looks like it was a uh, cheating. That's actually what Esav himself said later on when he realized what he lost. But Torah says otherwise. Torah says that Akadosh Baruch Hu allowed it to happen. He allowed him to sell his firstborn rights for just a pot of beans because he spurned the birthright. He disrespected it. He didn't value it. He didn't value the fact that the firstborn rights gave you a special sacrifice that you're able to offer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu each day. Firstborn rights gave you a special spiritual status. Firstborn rights made you the Kohen before the Kohanim. This was not something that Esav was interested in. Esav was interested in materialism. And since he was interested in materialism and cared less and to the point of spurning, disrespecting the firstborn, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, his blood is in all, his own hands, meaning he did it to himself. The sale is a valid, legitimate sale. Yaakov, the tzaddik, that understood the value of the firstborn rights is the righteous owner of it. Now, here we see that Akadosh Baruch Hu gave us, as part of the oral Torah, a clarification of this transaction. He didn't have to. He could simply say that Esav sold the firstborn rights. And that's it. But no. In order to protect the honor of the tzaddik, Yaakov, that no one would ever think for a moment, no one that's learned, no one that actually spent some time actually learning the Torah, would ever think that Yaakov did anything wrong, HaKadosh Baruch made sure that we know the background story. Now, We also see that HaKadosh Baruch Hu rewards us when we do whatever we can to act like tzaddikim. Where he says in the blessing and the promise to Yitzchak how much HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves Avraham. He says, I swore to Avraham your father I will increase your nation of the earth. I will increase your offspring like the stars of the heavens and will give to your offspring all these lands, meaning the land of Israel, and all of the nations of the earth shall bless themselves by your offspring. Why? Because Avraham obeyed my voice and observed my safeguards and my commandments, my decrees, and my Torahs. Obviously, Torahs is plural here. Torahtai. Why? Because it's a written Torah and an oral Torah. This is chapter 26, verse number 5. This is not only a proof that there is a written Torah and an oral Torah, but also that the Avot HaKadoshim, Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, all of the Avot, all of our forefathers, had the Torah before Matan Torah and fulfilled it. Hence the reason why Hashem loved them.
Now, Avram had two major tests where his wife, Sarah, was taken by Paro once and Avimelech another time. And one of these tests is being repeated to his son, Yitzchak. Avimelech thinks about marrying Rivka until he sees that Yitzchak is very friendly with this woman that's supposed to be his sister. And he says to Yitzchak, Mazot asita lanu, kimat shachab achad ha'am et ishtecha. What is it that you've done to us? One of the people nearly lead with your wife. Really, Chazal is talking about who's one of these people. He's saying about himself. Abimelech was still the same sick maniac, psychopath, that he was at the time of Avram. Meaning that his physical desires ruled his life. And he wanted to be with Rivka. Now, after he finds this out, he makes a commandment that no one's allowed to touch Yitzchak or his wife, Rivka, HaKadosh Baruch ensures that Yitzchak the Tzaddik gets special protection. And this Avimelech becomes a useful in the world by being a source of protection and even Parnasa for the Tzaddik. But this, of course, doesn't last very long when HaKadosh Baruch Hu blesses Yitzchak to such an extent where it says, Aish vayelech aloch vegadel ad ki gadal me'od. In chapter 26, verse number 13, it says that man became great and kept becoming greater until he was very great. What does that mean? Yitzchak became so wealthy, he was richer than even the king, Avimelech. This certainly caused jealousy, animosity. All of a sudden say, no, we're the ones that put you there. You took from us. This is our land. This is our this. Yeah, but before me, there was barely any of you living in this land, barely any of you eating, barely of you any of you drinking. There was nothing here. Like modern day Israel, that everyone's fighting about. No one fought over it in the early 1900s. Why? Very simple. The few Arabs that were there relative to today. They weren't successful in living off of the land. They weren't able to even grow an apple tree. Nothing. All the success of the land of Israel of today came after the Jewish people came back to their homeland. And that's why the fight over the land of Israel only started after the Jewish people came there. Or came back there. There was always Jewish people there throughout all this history even before 1948. And all of the people that say, listen, but uh, you know, there was a half a million Palestinian Arabs there that were kicked out from all the other countries, from Lebanon, from Jordan, from Egypt. They were kicked out from those land. Even their own so-called Arab brothers didn't want them. And they were living over there. So you guys kicked them out. Where do you think the Jewish people came from? The Jewish people that came to the land of Israel came from the Middle East. Not because they decided one day to move, but rather because they were kicked out of Iraq, kicked out of Morocco, kicked out of Iran, kicked out of Syria, kicked out of all of the Arab countries. Nearly a million Jews were kicked out of all of these Arab countries, putting them in a position where they have to go somewhere, 
And since the Jews were being murdered left and right in Europe, and six million of them were annihilated in a relatively short period of time, obviously Europe wasn't exactly a uh, wonderful choice, because even the Jews of Europe were running away from Europe. The only other place is to go to this little tiny little place called Israel that Hashem gave us. What do the Arabs do once we get there? Oh, you're stealing our land. What's stealing your land? You kicked us out. You took our houses. You took our money. You took our gold. You took our businesses. You took everything. You kicked us out. So we went back home. The same place that says in the Torah. We have to go somewhere. That's where we know that it's not about land. The whole fight between Ishmael and Yaakov has nothing to do with land. It has to do with Torah. The Torah versus the Quran. The Torah that's the only divine book that exists in the world. Shows us like Kadosh Baruch Hu giving us instructions, clear instructions in front of millions of people at Mount Sinai and for a period of over 40 years in a desert. We have a Kadosh Baruch Hu making open miracles for us. Everyone knows that Torah is real, including Bnei Ishmael. But what can we do that these Bnei Ishmael decided to create a Torah of their own that they call the Quran, that instructs them and educates them in an ideology of murder, where they have countless verses in their Quran of how their ultimate salvation cannot be so long as the Jewish people are alive. Their salvation can never be so long as the Jewish people are in existence. Where their prophecies are that one day the even the land the trees and the rocks will want to murder the Jews. So when you're a little Muslim, little Ishmael, and you're told that even the rock hates the Jew, the tree hates the Jew, and is going to tell you, hey Muslim, Muslim, come, come kill this Jew. What do you think the Muslim is going to want to do when he grows up? When you have a ideology that says the Jews cannot exist, there is no peace with such people. And anyone that thinks there could ever be peace, real peace, between Ishmael and Yaakov is simply delusional. There could be temporary ceasefire, but not peace. But going back to the tzaddikim, going back to Yitzchak, we see that Avimelech is jealous of him. But since Yitzhak knows that all of the Parnasa comes from Shemaim, all of the money, all of the sustenance, all of the good, all of the blessings are in the hands of Hashem. He doesn't spend any effort fighting over even the stuff that is his, clearly his, the water wells and so on. And he's a mevater, one of the required traits of somebody that wants to be righteous is to be a mevater. What's a mevater? Let it go. Don't fight over everything. There are certain things that you have to fight over. The honor of God, the honor of Chachamim, the honor of Torah, you must fight over. If somebody disrespects Hashem, disrespects Chachamim, disrespects the Torah, and you don't say anything, you have a serious problem. But if somebody disrespects you personally, there's no need to fight over every single time. If somebody wants to fight over you, says, listen, you owe me this, I paid you this, you took this, you took that, it's not always worth it to have a fight. I'm not saying to be a pushover and let other people st step on you, but not everything is worth a fight. As one of Chachmei Israel once uh, had a uh, person that lived in a community come to his house, knocked on the door and said, listen, Kvodarav, you uh, owe me uh, 600 shekels. 
He says, why? He says, because the paint you use to paint your house went through the sewage system to the pipes and caused the clog in my uh, in my house. I had to pay a plumber to fix all of it. The Chacham said, no problem, took money out of his pocket, paid his neighbor, said, I'm very sorry, and they parted as friends. Now, his Talmud, his student, was watching all of this and said to him, but Kvodarav, why didn't you at least debate him? Maybe you don't have to pay him. I mean, technically, there's, you have to have proofs. He said, listen, my dear son, I have at least three reasons of why, three proofs of why I didn't have to pay him. The first one is that he lives across the street. His building is across the street. The pipes from our house do not reach his house. So it's not possible that our, uh, you know, that the paint clogged the system. The second reason is, is that it's not possible for it to climb up, defy gravity, because he lives on the second floor. And the third reason is, we didn't paint the house. We paid the house. She said, okay, so for the rabbits. So why did you give him the money? He says to him, my dear son, you have to learn a lesson. You have to learn a lesson. If it cost me 600 shekels to have a good neighbor, that's a cheap price. Why? Because if I give him any one of those reasons, whether he agrees with me or disagrees with me, there's still going to be a little bit of hatred in his heart. Oh, but he did this, maybe he's wrong, maybe this, maybe that. Now, I gave him 600 shekels, he's happy, he paid the plumber, there was no loss for him anymore. Baruch Hashem. Now we can say good morning to each other, now we can say good evening to each other, now everything is okay, Baruch Hashem. That's a small price to pay for a good neighbor. And that's what we see, Yitzchak. But Yitzchak shows us the secret of being a mevatel, letting things go. Not being so stubborn about your way. Some people are addicted to winning. And they think it's good. They're so addicted to winning, they destroy all of their relationships. They destroy their marriage. They destroy their partnerships and business. They destroy their job. They destroy everything. Why? Because they keep winning. Sometimes you need to lose. Why? Because it's not worth the battle. And what's our proof? As soon as Yitzchak heard the different nonsensical statements and false uh, accusations of Abimelech about the property, and he thinks he owes it, he says, you know what, no problem. This is yours, that's what you think. This is yours, take it. That one too, take it. This one, take it. Take it, no problem. No need to fight. This is what you want? No problem, we're peace now. As soon as he did this, the verse says, Rechovot. <laughs> Initially, Yitzhak went to a different place. And success came over there. Abimelech didn't like it, fought with him over that too. He says, no problem, take that too. Meaning the test continued. Then he dug again and got more success. This time there wasn't a quarrel over it. At least not initially. But then the success got to such a point that Abimelech knew even if we try to cancel his lectures, even if we try to Tell people lies about him. Even if we try 
to get different people to go against him. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is with him. Look, he's succeeding in everything. All of the real important people are behind him. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is behind him. What do they do? They come to Yitzchak and they say, listen, Yitzchak, obviously HaKadosh Baruch Hu is with you. Let's be friends. Yitzchak says to them, Why have you come to me? You hate me. You drove me away from you. You kicked me out of your community. You said bad things about me. You wrote against me on the internet. You said no one should listen to me. What happened? Why are you here? And he said, we have indeed seen that Hashem has been with you. So he said, let an oath between us now, between us and you. And let us make a covenant with you. Shlomo HaMelech says, Berzot Hashem Darki Ish, Gam Oivav Yeshlimimo. When a Kadosh Baruch Hu is happy with the person that's serving him, is sacrificing everything for the sake of the honor of a Kadosh Baruch Hu, a Kadosh Baruch Hu will show you that. Not only by showing you success, where you have Parnasa and you have all the things that you need to continue serving him, but to such an extent that even your enemies will come and say, We want peace with you. Gam oivav yeshlimimo. We see here that this itself. Is success, but it doesn't end over there. After this covenant is made, and Yitzchak again knows these people hate him, but he says, "Fine, you want to be friends now, even though you stole from me, even though you went against me, even though you tried to kill me, even you did all these things against me. You want to be friends now? You want peace now? No problem. Let's be peace." He's mevate again. He lets it go again. That's when HaKadosh Baruch gives him the ultimate reward. What does it do? It says, V'yi b'yom ahu v'yavo avdei Yitzchak v'yagidu lo al odot ha'be'er asher chafru v'yom hu lo matzanu mayim. V'yikra ot ha'shiva al ken shem ha'ir be'er sheva. Ad ha'yom haze. After Yitzchak passed this extraordinary test where these people that went against him, these people that really chased after him, tried to torture him, tried to publicly shame him, made him look bad in the eyes of some people, and he still forgave. He still said, no problem. You want peace now? I'll be peace. It was on that very day, says the verse in chapter 26, verse 32, it was on that very day that Yitzchak's servants came and told them about the well they had dug, and they said to him, we have found water, meaning a bigger find than ever. A bigger find than ever. And he called it Be'er Sheva. Until this day, Be'er Sheva is Be'er Sheva. Here we see HaKadosh Baruch Hu protecting the tzaddik, protecting his honor, But only if the tzaddik stays a tzaddik and passes the test. It's not easy to be a tzaddik. It's not easy to be a tzaddik. Someone can much easier be a rasha and look like a tzaddik. How so? Look at Esav. Esav marries Yehudit, Basmat. Yitzhak wants to give him a blessing. We thought to ourselves, it was obvious. Uh, Yitzhak wants to give a blessing because he's married to two women and uh, Yaakov is still a bachelor. Perhaps it looks like Yitzhak is more serious about life. Perhaps it looks like Yitzhak needs uh, that uh, 
that Esav is more serious about life and Esav needs more help. He gets the blessing, no? But the truth is, we know that just like Esav was like a pig that has a sign like he's kosher with the split hooves, in reality, he's tame. Same thing with his wives. They had these names, Yehudit and Basmat, but that was not really their names. That just made them look like she's a Yehudit. She's a righteous Jew, but she really was a wicked. And Basmat, as if she had good, uh, good deeds and smelled good, in reality, she was a Rishayit. She was wicked. Both of them were idol worshippers. They were just like Esav. They were just like Esav. Initially, it looks like Esav is winning. Esav looks like he's married, he's got money. It looks like his, his father, uh, Yitzchak, favors him. This very same Yitzchak that got a lot of blessings and got a lot of siyat bishmaya, favors Esav. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu protects the Tzaddik. HaKadosh Baruch Hu protects the Tzaddik. When Esav is supposed to get the blessing, HaKadosh Baruch Hu speaks to Rivka and tells her, go and tell Yaakov that he has to listen to everything you say in order to get the blessing. And when Yaakov comes with wool on him to make it appear as if he is Esav, because uh, Yitzchak at this point was older and blind, wasn't able to see who he's talking to. The voice of Yaakov was the same as the voice of Esav, but yet Yitzchak says, Akol kol Yaakov Esav. The voice is the voice of Yaakov, and the hands are the hands of Esav. If the voices are the same, says the Midrash, then what do you mean the voices of Yaakov and the hands of Esav? Very simple. Esav, anything he did, he contributed to his own success. So when, you, when Yitzhak asked him, how did you uh, get these, uh, this food in front of me so quickly? How did you hunt so quickly, cook so quickly? So usually Esau's response would be, ah, you know, I'm a good hunter, I'm the best. But what does Yaakov say? Yaakov say, Ki ikra Adonai The reason why I was able to do it so quickly is because Hashem, your God, arranged it for me. It has nothing to do with me, Hashem gave it to me. So now Yitzhak is confused. Hashem, Esau doesn't mention Hashem. Esav is the ultimate kuchi be'otzim yadi. Esav is the one that says everything is my power, my strength, my ability. He says the voice is the voice of Yaakov. You talk like Yaakov. But when I touch you, it's fur, like Esav. Such is the way of the Reshaim. The biggest Reshaim. The biggest Reshaim, they also sound like Yaakov. But in reality, they are a self. Where do we see this? Right now, we see that the evil spiritual monsters are capitalizing on the vulnerability of the Jewish people being at war, being away from their homes, being under pressure. So what are they doing? Esav is sending his soldiers, his missionary, Christian missionaries, soldiers that call themselves messianic jews into the israeli army many of them are israelis that simply abandoned the torah and became idol worshiping christians that call themselves messianic jews some of them are americans that decided to join the israeli uh, army for sole purpose not to go kill the enemies of the Jewish people. No, no, no. To go and recruit more Jewish people to their idol worship. And they're so open and proud of it, they're making videos of it. They're making videos of them 
going to the place, the bases, and the camps of the Jewish soldiers to try to capitalize on their vulnerability and get them to abandon Hashem and go to idol worship. Now they're not coming saying, listen, abandon Judaism, become an idol worshiper with us. They say, no, they say, no, come on, the most Jewish thing you can do is believe in Yoshke. He was Jewish. We're not telling you not to be Jewish. We're telling you to be even more Jewish by not keeping any of the mitzvot anymore because this Yoshke died for you 2,000 years ago. The stupidest belief in the history of mankind. But yet to somebody I didn't learn to love, to somebody that's very vulnerable, this could make sense. This could make sense. They sound like Yaakov, they sound like they're trying to help, but in reality, as we've been telling all of you for years, the evangelical Christians that donate a lot of money to Israel, they're not donating, they're investing. The so-called Christian Zionists that love Israel, they don't love Israel. They love their church and they love their New Testament that tells them that in order for their salvation to come, with their Yoshke would come back from the dead, they have to convert all the Jews to Christianity. In so many words, it has nothing to do with loving Jews, but quite the opposite. By simply eliminating the Jewishness out of every Jew, by forcing them to abandon it and become Christians. In the past, they used to kill us physically, now they're trying to kill us spiritually. And they're doing it in the most heinous, pathetic, adulterous, and disgusting way possible by literally going as soldiers in the army. One of them I've told you about, he works for Bibi Netanyahu as one of his main people. Others are from different missionary communities. All of them seem nice. All of them are nice as long as you are playing along. But the moment that you reject what they're saying and show their true colors, they become a self. This is one of the places that we're seeing the prophecy from Yitzchak come to life today. The voice is the voice of Yaakov, but the hands are the hands of a self. Somebody that pretends to be Yaakov, but in reality he's Esav. Another place we see it is that, unfortunately, even within the Jewish world, you have different people pretending to be lovers of the Jews, lovers of the Torah, lovers of Hashem, but at the same token, with the same mouth, tell people to do things against the Torah. Like, it's okay to drive on Shabbat if you go in a synagogue, it's okay to be homosexual because even if you violate that mitzvah, you still have 612 others that you can keep, even though no one can keep 613 mitzvah because not everyone is a man, not everyone is a woman, not everyone is a Kohen, and the Bet HaMikdash is not here. But they disregard it. Why? Because it helps their agenda. They make it seem like they minimize the sin. As if you're just making one small sin out of so many opportunities to do mitzvot. So they sound like Yaakov, they sound like they love unity and they love all Jews. But the moment you show them that what they're saying is heretical, the moment that you show their victims that they're being lied to, you see their horns come out and their venom come out of their mouth as they publicly embarrass, deface, and literally try to destroy anyone that exposes their true colors. They sound like Yaakov until you expose them, and then they show you that they really are a sub, and they have been a sub the whole time. But not to worry, my dear children. HaKadosh Baruch Hu protects the tzaddik. As HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, to Yaakov, even though this may not be the way you wanted to get the blessing, 
This is the way you have to do it. With the betach bolot, and when there's turmoil, tribulation, get ready for a war. With the wicked, you have to also sometimes do things that you aren't prepared to do. They're conniving, you have to be conniving. And what happens after Yitzchak finds out that this actually happened and his dear son, the yeshiva bachu, Yaakov really stole the blessing as it looked like? He said, no, no, he didn't steal the blessing. If Hashem allowed him to get the blessing, that means it was Hashem's will that Yaakov would get the blessing. And in reality, he's really the tzaddik. And I was mistaken by thinking that I was going to give the blessing to Esav. Those that curse you are cursed. And those that bless you are blessed. The same blessing that Avraham Avinu got. Now after Esav, with all of his conniving ways, where he saw his whole plan fail. His plan to deceive his father and mother. His plan to deceive Yaakov. His plan to deceive the world failed. His plan failed. He could say, fine, I realize this is not the will of Hashem. Let me just it's do tshuva and join the tzaddik. Let me join the tzaddik. What does the tzaddik need? He needs money to build a yeshiva. The tzaddik needs a, uh, some support. He needs some publicity. He needs some students. He needs uh, coffee. What does he need? Let me go. So if already, obviously, Hashem is behind him. He's not behind me. I only look good. But in reality, Esav knows that he's a faker. Esav knows that he's a liar. Esav knows that he's going the wrong way. He's not delusional. He's a very smart guy. And even his father, Yitzchak, says, I can't give you the same blessing. Why? If you're not the tzaddik, you can't get the same blessing. If HaKadosh Baruch Hu made it so that your brother got the blessing, that means he's the tzaddik. And your blessing will depend on him. What is it? Yitzhak says to Esav, Behold, the fatness of the earth shall be your dwelling, and the dew of the heavens from above. Meaning the materialism that you're after, you'll get it. That's what you're about. You're about stew. You're about materialism. You're about marrying multiple women. Even if they're wicked. Even if they're against the Torah. Just because they're pretty. You're about power. Hashem will give you. The power that you want. Hashem will give you the money you want. By your sword you shall live. By your brother you shall serve. Yet it shall be. That when you are aggrieved, you may cast off your yoke, his yoke from upon your neck. The basic pshat of the pasuk is that Hashem will give Esav power. How? He's going to give him powerful warriors. This was clearly, as the Ababanel says, fulfilled when the Roman Empire conquered the world. Roman Empire that comes from Esav. The Greek Empire from Esav conquered the world. Today, and for the last couple of thousand years, Esav has been ruling the world. Whether it's Europe or the North Americas, that's Esav. How do they rule? Not because they're so nice. Not because they're so polite. But rather because they have powerful armies.
But you should know, says Yitzchak. Your brother you shall serve. Yet it shall be that when you are grieved, you may cast off his yoke from upon your neck. Here the Mefarshim say the basic pshat is that since you're living by the sword, you need to know that you and your brother cannot both be in power. As the Gemara in Masechet Megillah says, if you tell me that Edom is in power and Yaakov, Am Yisrael, is struggling, I believe you. If you tell me that Am Yisrael is in power and Edom is struggling, I believe you. But if you tell me they're both in power, I don't believe you. If you tell me they're both down, I also don't believe you. Why? It's against the rules of nature. HaKadosh Baruch created the world where one of them has to be up. So when does Edom get power? When you are grieved, you may cast off his yoke upon your neck. Meaning when Am Yisrael is not following the Torah, when Am Yisrael is cheating in business, when Am Yisrael is not keeping Shabbat, when Am Yisrael, instead of using the money to build Torah institutions, they go and buy pornography, like this moron that used to, supposedly used to be a rabbi, supposedly used to be a rabbi or learned in the yeshiva, decided that he's going to buy the biggest pornography company in the world about a year ago. HaKadosh who gave him hundreds of millions of dollars instead of building Torah institutions, instead of publicizing HaKadosh Baruch name, instead of doing good in the world. What does this moron do? He buys the number one pornography company in the world. This is a public transaction. You can easily find it on the internet if you really care about the details and the names and all that stuff. Pathetic. Chilul Hashem. And you know who publicized this the most? The anti-Semites. The anti-Semites publicizes the world. What is this rabbi doing buying pornography? I thought that uh, the Torah forbids pornography. Now even though this moron was hasn't been a rabbi, and I would question if he was ever a rabbi. He certainly hasn't been a rabbi in many years. He went into the investment world and abandoned the world of Torah. Still on his bio, still in his story, still all the things he publicized, yeah, I was a rabbi. <laughs> Needless to say, a Jew. What does this moron do? Desecrates Akadosh Baruch Hu's name by buying the number one pornography company in the world. This is literally following in the footsteps of everything that happened before the Holocaust. Jewish people investing into pornography. Exactly what HaKadosh Baruch Hu hates, this guy does. If you would say, listen, you know what? He's relying on certain things that maybe most of the customers will not be Jewish and therefore it's this and then you could rely on something, blah, blah, blah. Fine. Why are you publicizing this then? Why are you the new mascot for this pornography company? Going on different articles of how you're going to fix the pornography world. It's a respectable job. Literally the first time in history anybody said such a thing. Even the people that are listening to this, reading this, are laughing about this. The people that are in the business are laughing about this. Yeah, 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 it's a real job. Yeah, sure, it's a real job. When Am Yisrael does things like this, they empower Amalek. They empower Edom. Don't let anybody fool you to think, no, nah, why, it's just one guy, it's just one transaction. No, no, no. This affects all of Am Yisrael. This affects all of Am Yisrael. If I was a betting man and you told me a significant percentage of the reason of why Akadosh Baruch Hu tilted the 
scale against us and allowed Hamas to murder a few thousand of us, kidnap hundreds of us, torture thousands of us, make millions of us afraid to leave our house right now. A big part of that reason, call it 5%, 10%, or 50%, was this pornography transaction, I bet you my house on it. Why? The desecration of HaKadosh Baruch Hu's name. So you say, wait, so why are you mentioning it then? Aren't you increasing the desecration of Hashem's name? Opposite. When you publicize that this type of behavior has nothing to do with Judaism, this type of behavior is against Judaism, it's against God, it's against the Torah. And the fact that this imbecile publicizes that he's a Jew, needless to say that his partner is a Jew in the business, needless to say that they so-called he learned in yeshiva, and still he bought this pornography company, It's important for people to know they're not practicing Judaism. They're the enemies of Judaism more than Hamas is an enemy of flesh and blood today. He is more dangerous to Am Yisrael than Hamas is. Don't let anybody else fool you. Why? Because Hamas, what are they going to do? They're going to kill somebody? They kill somebody, that person goes to Gan Eden in most cases. And even if he doesn't go to Gan Eden right away, he eliminated most of his suffering for the sins that he made because of the way he died, because he died because he's a Jew. All the Hamasnik does is expedite this person's elevation to Gan Eden. But what is this filthy, disgusting excuse of a human being that bought this porn hub company do? He puts Jews in Gehenom. He puts Gentiles in Gehenom. He puts society in Gehenom. He's an enemy of the people. He's much more dangerous than Hitler himself. Don't let anybody fool you. Now, of course, Hitler killed bodies. People are like, wait, how are you comparing Hitler to a uh, porn hub? Hitler killed bodies. This guy's killing the Shamot. The danger is much greater. And anybody that's involved in any way to pornography or gambling or lending money with high interest that's predatory. They're dangerous to the Jewish people, more than Hamas. Why? Because the Kadosh Baruch Hu runs the world based on spirituality, not based on the materialism of the world. If you make sins, that puts the weight of all of Am Yisrael in a negative way. You desecrate God's name, puts the weight against all of Am Yisrael. You make the Torah look bad in the eyes of the world, all of Am Yisrael suffers. Both the ones that observe it and the ones that don't observe it. Everyone loses as a result of it. But to back to our point, Esav was told that he will get a blessing, but his blessing will be unique and in essence depend on the failure of Yaakov. What does this have to do with the tzaddik being honored? Besiyatu Bishmaya, we thought, look at what HaKadosh Baruch Hu is also telling Esav. You see, when a person starts to do tshuva, why is he doing tshuva? Because he lived like Esav, even if his mom and dad were Jews, and he was really a Jew, and she was really a Jew, but she lived like Esav. She thought that she was one of the nations. She walked around with immodest clothes. They desecrated Shabbat on a regular basis. Observing the holidays was only if it fit their schedule. They considered themselves as one of the nations. And the Judaism was simply part of the culture, if they even had time for that. Until Hashem sent Hamas, Imach Shimam Vizicham, Hashem sent the modern day Nazis. That reminded all Jews, whether you like it or not, whether you're religious or not, the enemy still hates you, just the same, and will remind you of your Judaism. 
So now all of a sudden, this person says, you know what, if they hate me already for Judaism, let me look at what Judaism really says. And they start realizing that Judaism is beautiful. The Torah is amazing. It has the answers to every possible question you could ever have. All the seven wisdoms that exist in the world are in the Torah. If you ever had the opportunity to spend time with Talmidei Chachamim, you'd see that they are better than you in everything, including your profession, including your expertise. Why? Because they learn everything in the Torah. What, you're an expert in business? You did billion dollar deals? Come sit down with a Talmid Chacham, he'll tell you more things about business than you can ever learn in business school. You could have a PhD in business. You could have masters. You could have every degree under the sun from Wharton Business School and Harvard and Cornell and every other Ivy League anti-Semitic school. You come to a Talmid Chacham that knows the details of real business, he'll take you to school with the amount of knowledge that he has and needless to say his negotiation skills. He knows more about you in business. He knows more about you about marriage. He knows more about you about chinuch, how to raise children, how to build a family. He knows more about you than you in real estate. He knows more than you in everything. Why? Everything is in a Torah. And just because somebody is religious and he happens to learn Torah doesn't make him a Talmud Chacham. I'm talking about Talmud Chachamim. Torah scholars, real Torah scholars, like our holy Dayanim that we have, our own dear Rabbi Ephraim, that just Baruch Hashem, Besiyat Nishmai, just published another book. Just yesterday was the announcement, the fifth, the fifth a, uh, uh, volume of Achtov Yisrael. This is well over 50 books that Rabbi Ephraim has written, and he's still in his early 30s. I don't think most people read 50 books. We see somebody like that, they look to you like a regular person, but just like the Chazoni says, they look like regular people, but they're angels among men. What does it mean, angels among men? They're literally better than you in everything. It behooves you to do whatever you can to serve them, to help them, to support them, to simply stand next to them. But people don't understand what a tzaddik is. People don't understand what a chacham is. They, stand, they look at superficial things like clothing, popularity, what people say, YouTube subscribers, foolishness. Says HaKadosh Baruch Hu, says HaKadosh Baruch Hu to Esav. Know this Esav. If you want the materialism, you'll have it. When somebody does tshuva, they realize that the lefty liberal mentality, the atheist mentality, the acting like a goy mentality, it's not going to work out. They're going to do tshuva. So you've gotten blessed already. You made some money. You made some money on Wall Street. You made some money on Main Street. You made some money in your business. You made some money here. You made some money there. But now you want to do tshuva. Go and use that gift that Hashem gave you and invest as much as humanly possible into publicizing the tzaddik, into publicizing the Torah, into publicizing HaKadosh Baruch Hu's name. Use that sword that Hashem gave you to bring life to yourself. By your sword you shall live. How? Your brother you shall serve. Who your brother? Which brother? Yaakov the tzaddik. Go serve him. Go serve the tzaddik. Why you should serve Yaakov? Why not go to Ishmael? Why not go to all the Canaanites? Why not go to Lavan? Why not go to the Reshaim? Why not go to... Because Yaakov is the tzaddik. Hashem gave you sustenance. Hashem gave you power. Hashem gave you a sword. Use every ounce of your energy to go serve your brother. Who? The tzaddik. Don't ask twice. Why? This is an opportunity of a lifetime. But what happens sometimes? The Satan fools you. Satan sees a new Baal Tshuva, sees a new convert, or somebody who wants to convert, doing good things. They start supporting the Tzaddik. They start publicizing Torah. They start sending 10%, 20% of their income, and even more, more tzaka, more opportunities. But all of a sudden they hear that Tzaddik said something they don't really like. 
all of a sudden the, the seed, the tzaddik is getting busy, so he doesn't get back to them right away. All of a sudden they see that tzaddik uh, can't be their friend and call them every Friday. All of a sudden they see that tzaddik is not giving them the personalized, customized, relationship that they expect after they invested so much money in him they figured with the money they're not only doing mitzvot they're buying the tzaddik so what happens they become aggrieved they get angry they said i used my sword to bring life i served my brother but he's not reciprocating like i want him to He's not dancing to my tune to make me be mad. Says HaKadosh Baruch Hu to all of those foolish people that think that the tzaddik needs them, that thinks that HaKadosh Baruch Hu needs them, that think that they're doing anybody but themselves a favor. He says to them, I'm the one that gave you the sword, I'm the one that gave you the sustenance, I'm the one that told you you can bring life to yourself by going to serve the tzaddik. What do you do? You think you bought the tzaddik. And you got mad. You say, ah, the heck with this tzaddik. I'm going to be on my own. I'm going to do my own thing. And what does the rest of the pasuk say? You may cast off his yoke from upon your neck. Once you abandon the tzaddik, you see that it's a downward spiral. Not only in your relationship with the tzaddik. That was your choice. But a downward spiral in your relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. All of a sudden, you don't want to keep Shabbat. All of a sudden, there's a forbidden relationship that you're interested in. All of a sudden, you're interested in businesses that you know are forbidden. All of a sudden, you're making yourself all types of excuses of why you're allowed to do things that you know you're not allowed. What happened? You left the source of Kedusha. You left everything. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave you a favor by bringing you an opportunity of a lifetime. You thought you were doing him a favor. You thought you were doing God a favor. You thought God needs you. Minus the money, minus the gold, says HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the master of legions. And here we see Rabotai Karim that Esav had an opportunity after an opportunity. It started off with having a father that was a tzaddik, a grandfather that was a tzaddik, a teacher that was a tzaddik, a brother that was a tzaddik. He went off. Hashem gave him another sign. Everything is failing. Do tshuva. Didn't do it. Then even more, the blessing that he gets from his father it's not just a blessing of what he's going to have, but rather a path to do tshuva. Hashem will give you money. Hashem will give you power. Hashem will give you position, stage, popularity. You can use all of that to do tshuva. Yeah, you made it in ways that are not supposed to be. Yeah, you did it in ways that HaKadosh Baruch says no. But now you want to do tshuva. Hashem will say... I'll still accept you. At the very least, use it. Use what I gave you to come and serve me. Connect to tzaddikim. Follow the ways of the tzaddikim. What do you think you're doing? You think you're helping the tzaddikim because they need you now. Well, how would they eat if it wasn't for me? You think a kadosh who needs you to feed his children? Well, how would they pay their rent if it wasn't for me? You think a kadosh who needs you? Little puny you? You can't go out to the bathroom without the assistance of HaKadosh Baruch Hu's miracles. You think that he needs you to go feed his tzaddikim? You're worse than Esav if you think that. And that's what happens to people. That's what happens to people that are spiritually stupid because of their arrogance. They not only lose the tzaddik. They not only lose other tzaddikim. They lose everything. And the worst part of it all, as long as they have an ego, they continue living in denial, thinking that they're doing okay. Thinking they're still religious. Thinking they're still going on the right path. 
even though deep down inside, they know they are a liar, and they're living a lie. Rabotai Yekirin, HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted to make sure that we know His Torah, and therefore He made His Torah beautiful. He made His Torah beautiful. But the people that learn Torah day and night, they have a secret. A secret that only B'Siyat Dishmaya I was privy to as a gift from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Each and every single time we have an opportunity to learn Torah is a gift from Hashem. Each and every single time we're next to Tzadikim, it's a gift from Hashem. Whether the Tzadik is a 12-year-old boy or our dear Rav or our Avrechim or anyone that we meet that's a real Tzadik that toils over Torah, it's all a gift from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Sometimes people look at me and they say, why do you do all that? And I look at them confused and I say, what do you mean? He said, you're the uh, one that has this and has that and this and that. Why are you serving them food? Why are you kissing their hand? Why am I serving them food? He said, yeah, you're not a waiter. Why am I kissing their hand? Yeah, you're not their servant. You're wrong. I'm taking advantage of an opportunity to serve my ticket to Gan Eden. These are our Kadosh Baruch Hu's favorite soldiers. These are my tickets to Gan Eden. And you want me to miss out on an opportunity to serve them, to help them, to sit next to them, to learn from them. If I could lay on the ground, they could step over me so they could climb their bed like, like uh, Antoninus did with it, Rebbe, a Kadosh, I'd be happy to. Just like I told Rav Chaim Kachlun last night at the event. I told him, if you ever need somebody to step on, to get on the bed, please. I'm first one in, I'm first one in line. He laughed in his humility, but he knew that I'm serious. Why? Because when you see tzaddikim, and you understand, at least in your limited capacity, what they are, you realize this is what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants. If you could spend one minute more with them, whether it's making them a coffee, or it's learning Dvar Torah from them, and you miss out on that opportunity because you think you have something better to do, that means you don't know what tzaddikim are, and you certainly know, don't know what Torah is. And that's why the Torah calls you an Amaaretz. An Amaaretz. A little boy, 12 years old, finished the Mishnah in six months. It wasn't too long ago he was a Mechalel Shabbat, but now he's able to do that. That's a tzaddik in the making. That Torah that he learned is better than anybody that's learning Torah right now in the world. Why? That's Torah of Tinoch Shil Bet Rabban. He's not even Bar Mitzvah yet. Those kids that finished the Mishnah most likely gave Am Yisrael a few more, a few more months, a few more years, a few more opportunities to overcome the obstacles and do Tshuva before Kadosh Baruch ends it all and brings Mashiach. A person that doesn't understand what tzaddikim are, is a person who doesn't know anything about Torah. Once a person knows what tzaddikim are, they themselves can become one. Rabotai Karim. People have many opportunities to learn Torah. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to us, choose wisely from who you learn. With that being said, I'll take some questions and we'll call it a day. I made the blessing before to anyone that's wondering. The reason why they doubted that Avram uh, could father Yitzchak is number one because he got much older than uh, 13 years older and number two because uh, Sarah 
was uh, kidnapped for a night. She spent the night with, uh, with uh, Abimelech. Even though Abimelech never touched her, still, the world didn't see that. Only HaKadosh Baruch Hu knew. And obviously, uh, he showed this prophecy to Avram. So that night that she was uh, alone in the room with Abimelech, people speculated that they could be from that. Oh, thank you everyone for the uh, blessings and the uh, good health wishes and all the nice messages that everyone's been sending me, Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem, the uh, infection is under control now. It's uh, certainly the tough part was uh, last week when half of my uh, whole face was black practically. It looked like it was a uh, uh, one of those disaster stories where you have to amputate. It was a really tough week. But Baruch Hashem, now everything is better and it's getting better. Still have... You know, some tough times in the uh, with the eye, but it's a world of difference from where it was last week. So thank you very much for your prayers and good wishes. Very much appreciated. <clears throat> My husband wants to know times that are correct for wearing the tzitzit since he wears it everywhere, even to sleep. Uh, well, the obligation for a Jew to wear a tzitzit uh, is, uh, if uh, he has a four-cornered garment, is during the day. During the day. This does not mean that as soon as the sun goes down, Jews take it off. In fact, most Jews do not take it off until they go to bed. And some are uh, some of the tzaddikim out there wear it even to bed. And the only time their tzitzit goes off is uh, when, uh, when they're in the shower. Uh, in fact, I uh, just heard a story from uh, Rabbi Ephraim just uh, the, the other day where uh, there was a, uh, uh, no, actually was it, no, I'm sorry, it was actually Rav Mizrahi, Rav Mizrahi Shichi, I heard a story from him. Just the other day, there was a, uh, a friend of his years ago that, uh, that uh, was very adamant about wearing a tzitzit and never taking it off. And one day he had to get some medical checkups. He had to get some type of CAT scan or some type of uh, um, screening of his uh, of his body. And when he went into that uh, room in the hospital, the uh, the, the technician uh, that operates the big machinery over there told him to remove his clothes so they could take the uh, pictures and everything. And he removed everything except... His, uh, his, um, uh, his uh, tzitzit. And, uh, you know, she argued with him. She said, what do you mean? You have to take it off also. He said, no, no, no. I'm not taking it off. This tzitzit stays with me. Every second that I wear this tzitzit is another mitzvah. If I'm going to take it off, even if it's for five minutes, I'm missing out on thousands of mitzvot. I'm not taking it off. Uh, I'm sh because I also know that you can still do everything that you need to do with this machine. Even if I wear this, you know, this tzitzit that's relatively thin garment. Well, this technician was very adamant about it and said, if you don't take it off, we're not going to do the uh, procedure. He said, also adamantly, I'm not taking it off. He got himself dressed and got out of the room. As soon as he got out of the room, he saw the doctor. The doctor that prescribed this whole procedure. He said, so did you get it? He said, no. He goes, what do you mean, no? Why not? He says, because the technician doesn't want to let me... Uh, do this whole thing with a tzitzit on. So he's okay, okay, hold on, calm down, let me go in there and talk to her. And the uh, the guy is sitting uh, outside, and uh, he hears the uh, doctor say to her, why this, that, but then all of a sudden, the doctor picks up the liquid that she was supposed to give this patient to drink before he went into the machine in order to allow the machine to read different uh, things within his body, the, the, where the liquid goes through the, uh, the, the, uh, the system. And the doctor quickly noticed that she used the wrong liquid. And had he drunk this liquid, he would have been dead on the spot. He yelled at this technician, you almost killed this patient, are you crazy? What a mistake you made. And this doctor, though, Seems like from the story he wasn't religious, came outside and even told the patient, this was publicized in Israel a few years ago, that uh, he told the patient, listen, you religious people have seven lives because God protected you from that mitzvah you didn't want to abandon. 
That's what saved your life. If you would have taken that tzitzit off and drank that liquid, you would be dead by now. So people that are very particular about tzitzit, generally speaking, do not take it off until they go, they have to when they, obviously when they bathe. Uh, but uh, the obligation is during the day. Um, but this is only for Jews. Non-Jews are not to wear tzitzit. Even if a non-Jew is in the process of converting, he should not wear a tzitzit until he completes conversion. Because tzitzit is a, uh, not only a uh, gift that HaKadosh Baruch Hu specifically gave to Am Yisrael, as we learn from the Shema that we, learn, that we uh, read every day, it's a specific gift that Hashem gave to Am Yisrael, but also it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a garment that is very symbolic of what Jews are, and you do not want to be someone that is mistaken for being a Jew. And it, it being your fault. This is also the reason why uh, the uh, Shulchan Aruch forbids us from selling mezuzot or tefillin to non-Jews. Sometimes we get uh, people that order mezuzot from our, uh, from our website. And uh, they're surprised that as soon as they place the order, uh, they get an email, usually from me, asking them what their uh, tradition is, whether they're Ashkenazi, Sephardi, Jewish, not Jewish. And of course, Baruch Hashem, people are honest, they tell me. And then as soon as they tell me that they're not Jewish, I tell them, sorry, I have to uh, cancel your order. Because according to that holy Torah that commanded us to have mezuzot, the same Torah also tells us that we're not allowed to sell mezuzot to non-Jews. That's what the Allah is. That's what Rabbi Yosef Karol, Paskin in Shukhan Aruch. That's what Chachamim say. Not allowed to sell, it, sell you a mezuzah. If you want, I can send you the money back. If you want to simply support the organization, we can use it as a donation. Whatever you want, no pressure. If they don't respond to me, usually I just refund them the money. We don't uh, hold the money hostage. Why? Because the whole reason of why we do what we do is because we want to publicize the Torah and observe every little ounce of it. And one of the things that a person needs to be very careful is not to make their own rules and say, listen, I'm uh, observing the Torah in my way, which unfortunately is very common today in the non-Jewish world where many non-Jews are starting to take on Jewish mitzvot. They start asking me about, oh, what do you think of my new kippah? Well, are you in the process of converting? No, I don't want to convert, but I want to wear a kippah. I want to wear a tzitzit. I want to keep Shabbat. You're a problem. Why? You're inventing a new religion. You're taking Jewish mitzvot and you're putting them into your non-Jewish life. There's no problem with a, uh, a non-Jew learning Musar and things that are applicable to their life. But once you take the holidays and the different uh, mitzvot that are, uh, the Jews are obligated to and make them part of your life, uh, that becomes a very serious problem. Many times also people, you know, they, uh, they're uh, not necessarily in the process of converting and uh, they start liking the Torah and they start reading the Torah, and they start learning more Torah than they're allowed to learn. Meaning it's not enough for them to just learn Musar and the uh, commentary on the Tanakh. They want to learn parts of the Gemara. They want to learn Mishnah. They want to learn Zohar. They want to learn Kabbalah. They don't realize that every single second that they spend learning these things that are forbidden to them, they're bringing a punishment unto themselves, not a reward. Why? Because these are specific things that Hashem gave to Am Yisrael. There's a reason why the oral Torah remained oral for many, many years. Because Hashem does not want, did not want what's happening today to happen. So if a person is a Jew, they need to wear tzitzit as often as possible. If a person is not a Jew, don't wear tzitzit. When you start wearing tzitzit, the day after you become a Jew. Or the day you become a Jew, I should say. The day you become a Jew, put on tzitzit. And that's for men, obviously, not for women. Um, evening of does a dome serve Yaakov now or is that after Gog is that already happening to some extent yes of course uh, all of the things that are being built in the world whether it's a uh, buildings or different types of technologies uh, the social media that we're using right now uh, many different things that are in the world that are operating many of it, many of the things are being built by non-Jews uh, and uh, the only reason why Hashem allows the internet to exist the only reason why Hashem allows social media to exist, the only reason why Hashem allows 
uh, everything in the world to exist is for the sake of the Torah. So people could learn more Torah, so could people could publicize Torah. It's not that some people can learn uh, uh, pornography. It's not that people can cheat in business or make billions. They do make billions and they do make sins with it, but the reason why Hashem allows this to happen, even though there are many sins made by the same exact vehicle, is because it also enables people to publicize and learn more Torah. So sure, the world exists for the sake of the people that learn Torah. This, if you want to uh, learn more about that, there's a Gemara in uh, Masechet Abu Dazara. Masechet Abu Dazara, in the first uh, Perik, talks about how the, uh, uh, the reason why Hashem allows the nations to succeed in building all types of buildings and structures and, uh, uh, and infrastructure and things of that nature is for the sake of the people that learn Torah. They're the ones, the people that learn Torah give uh, life to this world. In fact, the, during the holiday of Sukkot, at the time of the Bet Migdash, Am Yisrael would bring sacrifices for the sake of the well-being of the nations. Meaning we would come and pray to Hashem to protect the nations. Protect all of the nations, the 70 nations. Had the nations known how good this is for them, that we're bringing sacrifices to the Bet Migdash, they would have actually sent their own armies to protect the Bet Migdash. Meaning... We're not looking for the nations to become our slaves so we can abuse them like the Americans abused the African Americans or like they abused people in India or they abused people in China. No, no, no. We're not looking for people to uh, clean our shoes. But the key is to have a uh, uh, more Torah in the world and if your invention, your uh, resources, your money, your uh, speech, whatever it is that you're doing is going to help somebody learn more Torah, you're certainly uh, you know, using your abilities and talents for a good reason that you're going to be rewarded for. And if you're doing it literally for the sake of the Torah, you'll be rewarded both in this world and the next. But the key is to know that all of this exists for the sake of the Torah. It doesn't exist uh, for the sake of people making money. Hashem only you know, simply allows the making of money and, and, the, and the commerce and the capitalism and all that other stuff uh, simply because that's what motivates most people. But uh, the real reason behind all of it is because of the Torah. So there's more Torah in the world. Okay. Okay, we'll take one more question here in a second. Last week you explained that when Avram tells his servant to touch his breed, or it's really put his hand under his breed, not touch his breed, is not anything filthy, um, like a dirty mind people of our generation think. The breed is the most holy part of the body. I found this interesting uh, that in the Chumash there's no commentary about this. I feel like not every rabbi talks about this topic. Uh, maybe I missed the commentary and might be uh, wrong. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I've seen that this practice was very common, like Yaakov asked a, uh, Yosef to swear and he would do the same thing. Uh, yes, so as far as the commentary on the Torah is literally endless, meaning there are millions of books in Judaism. Uh, so if you have, for example, the art scroll Chumash, the commentary that you have is not even 1% of 1% of 1% of what's available out there. There is many, many different uh, sages that uh, elaborated these different points, uh, whether it's the Ramban, the, uh, the, Mar, uh, the Maharal, the uh, uh, Rashi, of course, uh, and uh, the Abarbanel, uh, the uh, Chizkuni, uh, Midrash Rabbah, uh, 
and many, many other midrashim. You also have the uh, Me'am Loez. There are literally uh, uh, millions upon millions of books in Judaism. So when I say something to you guys in a lecture, uh, and let's say you know you're new, a new person, and you're you know you're hearing me mention different sources, uh, Gemara or Zohar or a Midrash uh, or whatever I'm mentioning. All I'm doing is I am spoon feeding you a single line that I learned from one volume out of a collection of, I don't know, let's say uh, the Midrash Rabbah has almost 20 volumes, 17 volumes. The Zohar has a few dozen. The uh, Gemara has uh, the 60 Masechtot between the, 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 um, the Bavli and the Yerushalmi. Uh, point is, is that I'm giving you a tiny little bit, one line out of uh, tens of thousands of pages. Tens of thousands of pages. And this, what I've learned in my life is not even 1% of 1% of 1% of 1% of 1% of 1% uh, of 1% of the Torah. But, uh, you know, what you see in your, you know, in your Chumash or whatever book that you're reading is just part of what's there. It's not everything. There's no one place that has everything because it would be too big, too much. So there's different types of... Uh, uh, commentaries that uh, you know discuss different points, and the more a person learns, the more a person will get to see different facets of the same diamond. You'll see that the Ramban says this, the Abarbanel says that, the Marsha says that, the Chizkuni uh, says something else, the Midrash Rabba says this, the Midrash, uh, uh, um, you know, different Midrash. Uh, let's say the uh, 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 ones that are being quoted by the Meam Loez says something else, and so on and so forth. Uh, point being is, is that there are many, many different books, and uh, in our shuim, what we're doing is we're taking uh, little tidbits from a lot of different places and giving it to you on a silver platter, on a silver platter. So you're not necessarily always going to find it, and quite frankly, most of the time, you're not going to find most of the things that I'm saying to you in your basic version of the Chumash or the Gemara, because many times we're bringing sources from play other places that you haven't read and may not even know exist. Uh, so when it comes to the issues of the Brit uh, that uh, was mentioned uh, last week, much of what I mentioned last week comes from the uh, Gemara as well as the Zohar, the Zohar Kadosh. Uh, but also there are different Chachamim that uh, discuss this point in, uh, in their uh, Sfarim, like the, um, the Chida uh, mentioned uh, many things in regards to the Brit. Uh, and uh, of course there's uh, many other Chachamim. So the Torah is an endless ocean. It's an endless ocean. The more a person learns about it, the more a person is going to know how big this ocean is and how endless it is. Now, the fact that other rabbis are not mentioning this point, that's a different story. That's not because they uh, don't know it exists. If they don't know it exists, that's one thing. But generally speaking, uh, you know, anyone that's learned enough to be a rabbi, uh, learned enough to have you know, studied Torah for you know, 10, 20, 30 years, knows that these things exist, but they many of the times they choose not to discuss this uh, for different reasons. And some of those reasons we discussed in the film about Geinom, as well as the film about Tikkun Abrit, uh, which is a unfortunately a the wrong reason of why not to speak about these issues. But if you look at the books of the sages, whether it's the sages from 100 years ago or 500 years ago or 1,000 or 2,000 years ago, all of them spoke about this. The things that I'm saying are not so controversial in the world of Torah. They're only controversial in the world of political correctness, you know, where people are trying to please the public. I'm not trying to please anyone other than a Kadosh Baruch so I'm going to tell you everything that I know that it says and leave it up to you to make the decisions in your life, uh, you know, and, and not necessarily make a decision for you that you can or you can't handle something. I don't want to decide for you whether you can't or you can't handle something. I want to give you all of the information that I know on a silver platter and you'll be an adult and make an educated decision of what you want to do with that information. Other people that choose not to bring this information to the public about issues of reward and punishment, immorality, and things of that nature that are uh, unfortunately, a, uh, a, a very uh, common subject in the world of Torah, but uncommon in the world of uh, public speakers of today. 
uh, the people that choose that uh, not to discuss these things and in fact even speak against the truth are, uh, are obviously not only making a bad decision and misleading the public, uh, but their, their excuse is always that this generation can't handle it. In so many words, they've turned you and everybody else in this generation into mental midgets, ba'alemun, people that are deformed mentally and spiritually but simply cannot handle the truth. Uh, I don't think that we are in a generation of ba'alemun. I don't think we are in a generation of mental midgets. I think that if a person wants the truth, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will give it to him on a silver platter and he will understand or she will understand what our neshama is tuned to understand at that time. And the more they learn, the more they do the will of Hashem, the more their neshama will become even more fine-tuned to understand even more deep concepts of the same exact things they've already learned. Just like when a five or six-year-old kid learns about the parashat Noach and how Hashem destroyed the world versus the same exact person 20 years later learns the same parasha versus the same exact person learns the same parasha 20 more years later. Each time he learned it, his neshama was tuned differently to understand more things. To understand more things. And uh, this is why you should never make a decision for people of what they can or they can't handle. Uh, as long as you're, uh, you're teaching them the basics, you're allowed to teach this to everybody. But if you're teaching things that are you know, deep Kabbalistic concepts that are only for uh, uh, Torah scholars. That's a different story. That you're not allowed to teach the public. Uh, but everything that we teach in our shurim is, uh, is things that are not only uh, allowed to teach the public, but it's actually an obligation to teach the public. And this is why G'dolei Yisrael love us. If you, anyone saw the recent event, all these uh, giant chachamim, the biggest G'dolei Ador in the world today, uh, the biggest G'dolei Ador today, made public videos supporting us. Uh, why? It's not because of my peyot, and it's not because of uh, my good looks. And it's certainly not because of my beautiful eye over here that I can't open. It's because they hear their language from, from, from our, from our uh, speeches, from our books, from, from the things that we do. They're familiar with what we're talking about. Why? Because that's what they learn. Who speaks against us? The people that are against the Torah. Not the people that are for the Torah. The people that are against us are people that reform the Torah, modernize the Torah, change the Torah. Who are supporting us? The people that are loyal to the Torah. And may it be his will that all of us will stay loyal to the Torah, loyal to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, loyal to the Tzadikim that represent the Kadosh Baruch Hu in his Torah. And Bezat Hashem, bring more honor to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, more Nachat to Am Yisrael, so we can actually have the, the salvation come in the best possible way. Thank you very much for learning with me. May Hashem bless each and every single one of you. And Bezat Hashem, we'll continue learning together soon. Call to B'chavat Tzacha. את הרבנים, הרב ירון ראובן, הרב אפרים כחלון, ראשי רגעו בעזרת השם, שערכו בפעליון, שעלו מעלה מעלה, יהיה להם ברכה והצלחה, הקדוש ברוך הוא ימלא בשלות ליבם, לטובה ולברכה, שבכל אשר יפנו, יזכירו ויצליחו, יזכירו עוד לעשות כאלה וכאלה, הודיעו תורה לאדירה, אמן ואמן.